The U.S. Arab Radio Network is proud to offer the Ray Hanania Show with veteran journalist Ray Hanania, the U.S. correspondent for the Arab News newspaper. U.S. Arab Radio broadcast content Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. on WNZK AM 690 in Detroit, WDMV 700 in Washington, D.C., and simulcast through stations around the country. Programs will rerun from 5 till 6 p.m. Visit us on Facebook at U.S. Arab Radio. And we're also streaming live on Facebook.com forward slash Arab News. And good morning, morning, everybody. This is Ray Hanania here at the Ray Hanania Radio Show, sponsored by Arab News and broadcast on the U.S. Arab Radio Network every Wednesday morning in Detroit on WNZK AM 690 and live in Washington, D.C. on WDMV am 700 radio and on facebook.com slash arab news at the arab news newspaper facebook page which has some six million viewers so we're happy to be there and uh we're looking forward to a great discussion this morning in uh, segment one we're going to be speaking with middle east institute senior vice president and former ambassador gerald fierstein uh he's going to discuss with us the situation in yemen this past week uh, President Biden's special envoy to Yemen, Tim Lunderking, announced an additional $160 million in aid to Yemen while criticizing the roles played by Iran and the Houthis. He called the situation in Yemen a dire and one of the worst humanitarian crises in the world. Later at the bottom of the hour in segment two, we'll speak with Ali Mohammed Khalid, who is a sports editor at Arab News. And we'll be looking at how well Arab athletes performed in the Tokyo Olympics that just ended this past week. Arab athletes first participated in the Olympics when Egypt competed in 1912 in Stockholm. So we're going to take a real quick break here at the Ray Hanania show. And uh, as soon as we come back, we will uh, introduce you to Ambassador Fierstein and talk about Yemen. I'm Ray Hanania. We're going to be right back right after these breaks. ArabNews.com, bringing you breaking news from across the Middle East and the latest on Arabs in America. Get inside the latest headlines with expert analysis and insights at ArabNews.com. Join over 5 million Facebook fans and over 10 million monthly readers. ArabNews.com, news that matters to you. While we've been staying safe at home, scientists have been on a journey. The destination, a COVID-19 vaccine. This journey began decades ago with research into other coronaviruses. Scientists built from there with months of research and development, cooperation with other experts worldwide, and clinical trials on tens of thousands of volunteers of diverse race, age, and health status. They arrived at a safe, effective vaccine, and hundreds of thousands in Michigan have already been vaccinated. But the next step is ours. We need to get the vaccine when we can. Keep wearing masks correctly and taking precautions until we reach our destination. Freedom from COVID-19 and getting back to the lives we love. Discover the facts for yourself at michigan.gov slash COVID vaccine. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Ziad brand, quality products from our family to yours. Ziad Brothers Importing offers the finest quality products, including brands like Sultan, Kraft, Nestle, Hook, Rico Picon, Donna, and many more. Ask your retailer to carry these fine products because you deserve the very best. For more information, visit our website at www.ziad.com. That's www.ziad.com. Ziad, quality products from our family to yours. At Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic in Dearborn, we provide effective physical therapy sessions in order to limit pain and discomfort. Top Rehab provides physical therapy care for any diagnosis prescribed by a physician, and we regularly see and treat conditions such as stroke, TMJ, fibromyalgia, sciatica, joint pain, and more. We use a variety of pain management methods, including modalities, soft tissue mobilization, and therapeutic exercise. If you're in need of physical rehabilitation or physical 
physical therapy, get the highest quality health care at Top Rehab. Most insurance is accepted and we're open Monday, Wednesday, and Friday 8 to 6, Tuesday and Thursday 8 to 5, and Saturday 10 till 2. Call for an appointment today at 313-846-0555. That's 313-846-0555. Choose Top Rehab Physical Therapy Clinic on Michigan Avenue in Dearborn. Life's too short to be in pain. The U.S. Arab Radio Network is proud to offer the Ray Hanania Show with veteran journalist Ray Hanania, the U.S. correspondent for the Arab News newspaper. U.S. Arab Radio broadcast content Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. on WNZK AM 690 in Detroit, WDMV 700 in Washington, D.C., and simulcast through stations around the country. Programs will rerun from 5 till 6 p.m. Visit us on Facebook at U.S. Arab Radio. And we're also streaming live on facebook.com forward slash Arab News. And welcome back. I'm Ray Hanania, and I'm on the line with Middle East Senior Vice President and ba- former Ambassador Gerald Fierstein. Um, he joins us to discuss the situation in Yemen. Uh, Ambassador Fierstein, and I hope I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. It's, it's good. Yes. Thank you. He he was the U.S. ambassador to Yemen under President Barack Obama from September 2010 to October 2013. And then he served for a few years uh, between 2013 and 2016 as principal deputy assistant secretary of state for Near East Affairs in the Department of State and uh, has a lot of background in this area about Yemen. Um, You wrote recently about uh, you were kind of reflecting on the campaign trail on President uh, Biden. Um, what he had promised to bring the Yemen conflict to an end. And they reversed the what he said was the tough, you know, uh, ill-conceived policy of the Trump administration. Um, and they seemed like they were softballing the approach to Yemen. But then five months into it or six months into it, they realized that things weren't going the way they thought they would go. And they're back to supporting and pushing the Saudi argument, which is, that we have to be tough with the Houthis um, who are backed by Iran. And maybe this is a bigger conflict than just, you know, a conflict in Yemen, that it has some bigger dynamics there. Explain all that to us. What, what happened? Well, I think that, that uh, you, you summed it up uh, pretty well. Uh, there was a, a view here in Washington, and I think uh, more broadly in the, in the West, that the, uh, that the issue... Uh, was really the Saudi military intervention, the coalition operations in Yemen, and that if you took that out of the equation, uh, that the parties to the dispute, primarily the Houthis and the uh, legitimate government of Abdurrahman Mansour Hadi, would be able to come to the table and reach some kind of an agreement under uh, UN uh, uh, negotiations, under UN auspices, uh, in order to, to move forward. And so um, when he was a candidate, uh, as well as in the opening weeks of, of his term as president, uh, President Biden was very clear in saying that the U.S. strategy would shift away from the Trump approach, which supported the Saudi uh, intervention, uh, and emphasize uh, the, uh, the support for the U.N. negotiations and also press the Saudis to uh, stop their military operations inside of Yemen. Uh, and, uh, and he also appointed Tim Lenderking, a uh, career US uh, diplomat, uh, to be our special envoy and to support the UN. Uh, but as you said quite correctly, over the last five or six months, uh, rather than returning to the negotiating table and cooperating with the UN, Uh, The Houthis, in fact, have expanded their military operations. They've launched new aggressions inside of Yemen, uh, particularly in uh, Marib government, and also have increased the amount of their cross-border attacks into Saudi Arabia using drones, Scud missiles, and other kinds of weapons uh, to uh, try to threaten uh, Saudi civilian infrastructure. So uh, what we've seen over these past Uh, six weeks or so, six or eight weeks, is that the administration has been willing to take a harder line 
uh, with the Houthis and to single them out uh, for responsibility for the failure uh, to uh, negotiate and also, of course, for increasing uh, military conflict inside of Yemen. Do you think that the uh, this reversal, I mean, I, everybody always wants to, uh, and I, I'm not saying it's wrong, but everybody always, always wants to say, let's give peace a chance. Let's open the door to the other side. Maybe they're going to be reasonable with us. But that assumes that they have an agenda that we think is their agenda. And it doesn't assume the role of outside uh, factors and players like Iran, which really I don't think really gets along with the Gulf very well. So anything that they can do to disrupt that region, I think that's what they're going to do. But did was there a moment when you think that they realized that, whoa, wait a minute, this has gotten worse. Um, it's contributed to a worsening situation for the Yemeni people. At what point did they realize that, no, no, no we got to take a tougher stand, that we were in the right direction in the beginning? Well, I think that, you know, uh, that certainly um, the, the Houthi response to uh, the U.S. initiative uh, uh, made it clear that the Houthis weren't uh, weren't willing to uh, to uh, stop, and and you know, and Saudi Arabia, of course, uh, put on the table along with the UN, put on the table uh, ceasefire initiatives. They offered uh, a ceasefire, comprehensive ceasefire, to the Houthis, which was rejected. Uh, the UN had uh, tried to negotiate for uh, many months. Uh, what they call the joint declaration, which included a number of, of points that the Houthis had demanded, including reopening the Sanaa airport, uh, uh, lifting the, uh, the blockade on uh, the port at Hodeida, uh, taking some other steps that the Houthis uh, had indicated that they required, uh, but still the Houthis uh, refused to agree to uh, stop the military operations and to return to the table. And so I think that as, as you know, we saw these uh, cumulative failures uh, on the part of the Houthis to, uh, to accept uh, a, a political approach, it became clear to the administration that they needed to take a harder line. And of course, the, the broader concern is that if the Houthis were to be successful in taking control of matter of governorate, uh, which as you know, is the source of much of uh, Yemen's oil and gas supplies. It's also home to well over a million internally displaced uh, people, uh, people who had fund, uh, you know, largely fled from Houthi controlled areas uh, to an area that uh, was still under the control of the government. So um, if, if the Houthis were successful in, in getting control of Madab, that that would fundamentally shift the balance uh, inside of Yemen and make achieving any kind of a political agreement that much more difficult. It, it seems that they've recognized that because they've made a huge push there, I think, to really kind of take over. Are, are we dealing, Do you, I mean, in all honesty, are we dealing with the Houthis or are we dealing with Iran or are we dealing with some mix of the two or is, is Iran just happening to be there because they just don't like the Gulf um, or are they what, what's their role? Well, it's a very good question, and I'm not sure that there's a very clear answer. I, I think that early on, um, again, you know, another shift in the administration policy from Donald Trump to Joe Biden uh, involves Iran specifically, and that was a desire of the administration to uh, return uh, to the Iran nuclear deal, the JCPOA. Uh, and to open a uh, channel of communications with the Iranians, hopefully to be able to address some of these other issues that have been uh, areas of concern about Iranian behavior over these years. Uh, and there was, I think, uh, a hope as well that the Iranians, uh, in order to help improve the prospects for that negotiation, uh, would also support a political uh, negotiation in Yemen, that Yemen was considered by many people, including me in all honesty, uh, to be an area that was most open uh, to resolution because it was not strategically important for Iran uh, and therefore they could afford to be forward leaning and helpful in trying to bring Yemen, uh, the Yemen conflict to an end. Uh, that hasn't worked out that way again. 
Um, the, the issue of what is the relationship between the Houthis and Iran is a little bit unclear, I think, and I've always argued that the fundamental issues that are driving the Houthi uh, position inside of Yemen are, are by and large Yemeni. Uh, it's not that they are a proxy. I've never considered them to be a proxy of Iran, uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is that they're heavily dependent on Iran for their weapons and for a lot of other kinds of support, and therefore they can't afford to ignore Iranian views and Iranian positions. Uh, and uh, there are, is certainly a view, uh, a legitimate view, I think, that the Iranians are linking uh, what happens in Yemen to the state of their negotiations in Vienna uh, with the US about uh, the uh, nuclear deal and that, uh, and that the Iranians see Yemen in a way as a pressure point on the United States to be more forward leaning and lifting sanctions and doing other things related to the nuclear problem. I, I know a lot of maybe younger listeners may not uh, identify with this, but I know you and I would back during the, the uh, late sixties, this idea that if we just softened up with the Viet Cong uh, in Vietnam, if we just uh, showed them that we wanted peace, that yes, we'll all be happy. Um, and we kind of withdrew and basically lost that entire conflict. Is there a threat that in this Yemen area that that could happen, you know, again in the Gulf? Well, I, I think, you know, I, I mean, the, there is an interesting parallel in, the, in these two things. And that is that, that within the Houthi movement, uh, there are certainly um, elements. I wouldn't say that it's all Houthis, uh, but there are certainly elements within the Houthi movement who have uh, this uh, very uh, millennial uh, vision uh, for their uh, role in, uh, in Yemeni society. Uh, there are many Houthis who believe that they are the rightful heirs uh, to the Imami, uh, which was, as you know, a Zaidi Shia uh, uh, government that ruled uh, North Yemen for many, many years, uh, and uh, and that they are the heirs to that uh, to that government, and that they want to reinstall uh, the imamate under their leadership. Uh, and so it makes it very difficult if you're dealing with people who believe that they have this God-given right uh, to govern Yemen. Uh, to, uh, to try to negotiate a political agreement that would clearly end up with them having less than total control of the society. So, um, so this is a problem. And so you can make that argument that the, the reason that we couldn't negotiate with the Vietnamese is that the Vietnamese had one objective, which was to govern Vietnam, right. uh, and that they weren't going to stop and they weren't going to accept anything less than complete control. And there are certainly Houthis who believe that. There are other elements within the Houthi movement who are more than willing to negotiate and, and to, to reach some kind of a compromise agreement. And so the question is really, what is the balance of forces within the Houthi movement uh, towards those who would accept uh, a, a negotiated position in Yemeni society versus those who are seeking total control? What do you think needs to be done in your opinion? I mean, what if, if Obviously, if you were back there as ambassador and and I know you have some influence on this because you have so many years, probably more than a lot of people in terms of what's happening in Yemen. What do you what do you think needs to be done if you were to advise the president? What, what do you think he should do? Well, I think that uh, um, it, it is actually what what we have written. Um, uh, I wrote uh, a piece uh, with my colleague Fatima uh, Abu Al Asrar, uh, which appeared in uh, War on the Rocks, uh, a blog here in Washington, um, that basically said that the number one priority at this point has to be ensuring that the Houthis don't succeed in matter. Uh, that uh, that un until again. You know, as you as we discussed, this idea that what we need to do is to strengthen those elements within the Houthi movement who want to negotiate, who want to cooperate with the UN, uh, and reach a, a negotiated solution. Uh, we need to strengthen them and weaken the elements who think that they can still win a military victory. So the first requirement is really 
to prevent the Houthis from achieving their objectives in matter uh, and uh, convincing again the Houthi leadership that there's no military solution. And then, uh, of course, as you know, uh, we have a new uh, UN special envoy who's just been uh, named officially uh, within the last few days, Hans Grunberg, uh, who is a Swedish diplomat uh, and uh, is currently serving as the European Union's special envoy for Yemen. So he's very familiar with the situation on the ground. Uh, he'll be picking up the responsibility for Martin Griffiths and we'll see what he can bring to the table uh, in terms of new incentives uh, for the parties to, to return to negotiations. The other point that we've made is that on the ground in Yemen, there are a number of different elements that are working uh, on local solutions, local ceasefires, local prisoner releases, local uh, you know, uh, release of detainees. Uh, and we need to do more to support those uh, elements so that even while we're waiting for a comprehensive solution to the problem, we at least can address some of the immediate issues uh, that are so difficult for the Yemenis. And of course, as you said, uh, the US just announced $165 million in new humanitarian assistance uh, and has uh, asked other uh, partners in the international community also to come forward uh, with additional assistance to try to address that critical uh, humanitarian crisis. And do you think that the uh, uh, that the U.N. getting involved is will that help? Do you think? I mean, uh, the U.S. I think realizes that we got we have to be tough, tough. As you point out, we can't allow them, the Houthis, to militarily win in any of those districts in Yemen. If they do that, what what's the point? They would never sit down with us. Um, and I think it'll just uh, just my opinion, obviously, that it would just get worse. Um, what role can the U.N. play? to help push this to a resolution, do you think? Or can it, or will it just be interference? Well, I think that I think that ultimately the UN has an important role to play because they are the only party really that is seen by Yemenis broadly as uh, impartial, uh, as neutral in the negotiation, and therefore uh, they can play that role. The, the Yemenis uh, coming together on their own uh, would have a great deal of difficulty. And uh, even going back to my own experience in 2011, 2012, although ultimately the, the Yemenis themselves shaped the, uh, the initiative that became the GCC initiative, uh, nevertheless, uh, they relied on outside elements, uh, you know, including the diplomatic community, including uh, the US and other embassies in Sana'a, to help facilitate and, and mediate among the parties to, to help them uh, basically come to the agreements that they, that they needed to, to come to. And I think that the UN can play that role again, that, that while the ultimate structure of the resolution of the conflict is going to be a Yemeni structure, and it has to be a Yemeni structure, nevertheless, the UN can play that critical role of bringing the parties together a neutral territory and allowing them to work out these issues and helping to facilitate uh, the negotiation. My my observation is that uh, that this is a bigger issue between Iran and the West. Iran sees an opportunity to provide support to the Houthis uh, to push them into you know these uh, military uh, um, uh, drives that they're targeting in different areas of Yemen. And they're never going to compromise. I mean, uh, it's one thing to say that maybe we can deal with the Houthis because there's some reasonable people maybe with them. But um, as long as the Iranians are there, can we even expect an end to this conflict? I mean, would Iran allow that? Do they have that much influence over the Houthis to, can you, to, to continue this drive? Well, I, I do believe that um, if we get to the point where the Houthis see that their own interests are... Uh, are in favor of reaching an agreement uh, that they will do that. Um, I, I think that you know that, that the Houthis again are driven primarily by issues inside of Yemen. Uh, yes, they receive a great deal of support from Iran, uh, and they need to listen to the Iranians. Uh, but I'm not sure in my own mind uh, that the Houthis would 
uh, refuse to make an agreement that, uh, that they want to make uh, because they're getting pressed by the Iranians. Uh, and the other reality is that, um, is that while Iran has certainly been involved over these past five or six years, um, uh, unhelpfully, uh, while they have taken advantage of the internal situation inside of Yemen uh, to improve their situation, uh, to uh, insert IRGC and Hezbollah uh, fighters into, uh, into Yemen, um, uh, and, and that uh, they have therefore been able to, to challenge Saudi security. Uh, nevertheless, they don't have a, that long history of involvement in, in uh, Yemen. And the fact of the matter is that the Houthis in Saudi Arabia have been able to work with one another over the years as well. And so uh, it's not necessarily the case that uh, if the uh, Houthis see an advantage in uh, having a stronger relationship with Saudi Arabia versus Iran, uh, that that wouldn't be something that they would pursue and that they would agree to. And as we know, the Saudis have said uh, that they are talking to the Houthis, that these uh, talks have been going on for many years. Uh, and, uh, you know, and there is the possibility at some point uh, that Saudi Arabia and the Houthis may reach some kind of an agreement that would allow the Houthis to uh, move forward and negotiate a resolution inside of Yemen. Yeah, Iran's role, though, I think uh, is much more uh, imperiling. Um, I don't uh, it just seems hard to believe that Iran would step back and say, OK, yeah, you guys want to end this. Go ahead and end it to them. There must be great benefit to see this happening. I mean, the U.S. and Saudi are the biggest humanitarian donors, I think, to the to help the, you know, the uh, victims of this conflict in Yemen. Um, and which leads me to another question I want, I'm hoping to ask, who else needs to step up to the plate to make this happen? But back to my first point, I don't think Iran wants to see um, this conflict resolved. Do, do you think I'm wrong or am I leaning in the right way or do you think I'm just too uh, negative toward Iran? Well, uh, it, it, it's it, it's hard to say. And and. You know, it, you know, is it possible that Iran is linking uh, progress in the conflict inside of Yemen to broader issues of interest to them, primarily the negotiations that are going on in Vienna? Uh, as you know, there are also uh, talks between Saudi Arabia and Iran that are being sponsored by the Iraqi government uh, in Baghdad. Uh, and, uh, and certainly Yemen has been on the agenda uh, for those discussions as well. Uh, and so, you know, uh, would uh, the Iranians balance their competing interests, uh, maintaining pressure on Saudi Arabia through the Yemen conflict, uh, but also obviously having an interest in seeing a reduction in tensions in the region uh, that would allow them to get some sanctions relief uh, and uh, and to do other things that might help their economy, um, you know these are these are balancing issues that uh, Tehran has to be considering. And the other reality is that we actually don't know uh, what the uh, new government in Tehran is going to um, think about these issues and how is this new president Raisi uh, going to uh, to see. Um, his way through to developing a policy and a position for Iran. So, uh, so there are a lot of unknowns out there about where the Iranians are and what the Iranians actually are seeking uh, and whether or not they would accept um, as uh, the price for other benefits that they might get, uh, that they would uh, see a reduction in their own in, uh, influence inside of Yemen. You know, it's been going on, I think, five or six years. Do you see any hope uh, that this might uh, resolve itself soon? Or is there a concern that it's going to get worse before it gets better? Well, it's a very good question. I mean, uh, the, uh, the Houthis uh, moved into Sana'a in September of 2014. So we're coming up to the seventh anniversary, really, of the beginning of this conflict. Um, you know, I, I think that Again, there had been optimism earlier on in this year that, uh, that we would be able to, to push forward on a political resolution through the UN uh, uh, auspices. 
uh, that uh, has suffered a setback. There's no question that, uh, that I think people are less optimistic today than they were maybe in January or February. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, uh, all wars come to an end uh, eventually, and uh, this one will as well. Uh, I think that the key right now is once again to convince the Houthis. It may be, it may be that the Houthis saw uh, the arrival of the Biden administration and President Biden's statement in February as a signal that uh, they could, in fact, increase their uh, military activities and that perhaps once again, uh, you know, since the U.S. was pressuring Saudi Arabia to stop its operations, uh, that they would uh, be able to achieve the military victory that they hadn't been able to achieve earlier on. And so it's important to convince them that, in fact, that has not changed and that they're no more able to win militarily today than they were last year or the year before. And if we can do that, if we can convince them that there is no military victory in sight, then perhaps that will shift the balance and bring them uh, back to negotiations. And then uh, hopefully we can see some progress. So that probably means uh, where we're at today, standing tough um, while providing humanitarian aid where it's needed in Yemen. I mean, we are the biggest donors. The U.S., I think, is the largest, uh, followed by the Saudis. And uh, uh, doing that probably is the only way to bring this to a resolution. I think that that's right. I think that's right. Um, you had asked who else can be helpful. Uh, you know, there is a Friends of Yemen organization. The UK has always been very deeply involved in Yemen issues. Uh, the other uh, uh, permanent uh, members of the, of the UN Security Council, Russia, China, France, uh, all have roles to play. Uh, Germany has over the years been uh, very influential uh, with, uh, with Yemen, uh, particularly uh, they've had a good relationship with the Houthis over the years. So, uh, so you know, all of these uh, governments can uh, can uh, play a, a, a role in trying to convince the parties to come back. I think, you know, it's really not a question of convincing the, the, uh, the Hadi government. I think that they're already there. It's really a question of convincing the Houthis that they need to come back to the table. All right. My guest this morning, former Yemen ambassador, Gerald Fierstein. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, really, it was a real pleasure to have you on the radio show. I enjoyed the conversation. I think you gave us some great insight into a very important conflict that uh, everyone hopes will be brought to an end soon. So thank you for joining us on radio. We appreciate it. Well, it was my pleasure, Ray, and happy to talk to you anytime. All right, good. Well, we look forward to having you on again. Uh, hopefully, uh, you know, maybe there'll be uh, peace in our generation. I can't remember the words that Nixon said, but... Um, you know, it's just uh, I it that worries me that whole look back, you know, to see this, if there was a conflict that ever paralleled uh, more, I think it's this one. But again, that's just my opinion. But Ambassador, thank you so much. You have a great day. You too. Thank you. All right. I'm Ray Hannity. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be talking with uh, the sports editor at Arab News, Ali Mohammed Khalid, about Arabs at the Tokyo Olympics. I'm Ray Hanania. We're going to be right back right after these messages. ArabNews.com, bringing you breaking news from across the Middle East and the latest on Arabs in America. Get inside the latest headlines with expert analysis and insights at ArabNews.com. Join over 5 million Facebook fans and over 10 million monthly readers. ArabNews.com, news that matters to you. Imagine you're on a train track, somewhere miles away, a train is headed your way. You can't see it yet, but it's coming, slowly but surely. If you have prediabetes or you're at risk for type two diabetes, you may be on the wrong track and diabetes could be heading your way. Bit by bit, the danger is getting closer and closer. So should you stay on the track you're on now or move to make a change and reduce your risk? If you have prediabetes or you're at risk for type two diabetes, you may qualify for the National Diabetes Prevention Program in your local community. This one-year program could be the ongoing support you need to put you on the right track. Not only did participants lose weight, they cut their risk of type 2 diabetes in half. Ready to get on board for a healthier future? 
Learn more about the National Diabetes Prevention Program and what else you can do to manage and prevent diabetes at michigan.gov slash diabetes. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. New Dawn Academy provides your kids with a curriculum that's rich in science, technology, engineering, and math. We want students to really experience what problem solving looks like. What does it mean to build things together? And really working on those analytical skills is what makes New Dawn Academy's program very unique. This school will certainly provide them with academic excellence, but also state-of-the-art buildings and inviting to students. Are your hands feeling numb? Do you feel pain opening up a jar, turning a key? Are you noticing that your elbow and your shoulder are becoming stiff? Or were you recently injured in your arm? Hello, I'm Dr. Albajit Katranji, and at the Katranji Hand Center, which just recently opened down the street from the Somerset Mall, we can provide you with the latest in hand, wrist, elbow, and shoulder care. Visit us at www.katranjihandcenter.com to learn the latest techniques that we have to offer you, and I look forward to taking care of you. Visit us in Troy at 1565 West Big Beaver Road, Building F, or call Katranji Hand Center for an appointment at 248-869-4263. That's 248-869-4263. The U.S. Arab Radio Network is proud to offer the Ray Hanania Show with veteran journalist Ray Hanania, the U.S. correspondent for the Arab News newspaper. U.S. Arab Radio broadcast content Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. on WNZK AM 690 in Detroit, WDMV 700 in Washington, D.C., and simulcast through stations around the country. Programs will rerun from 5 till 6 p.m. Visit us on Facebook at U.S. Arab Radio. And we're also streaming live on facebook.com forward slash Arab News. And welcome back. I'm Ray Hanania here at WNZK AM 690 Radio in Detroit and WDMV AM 700 Radio in Washington, D.C. We are broadcasting live on the U.S. Arab Radio Network at ArabRadio.us and uh, with our sponsor, Arab News Newspaper on facebook.com slash Arab News, where you can watch and listen to this uh, show. Right now, I want to introduce our next guest, Ali Mohammed Khalid. He is the uh, Dubai-based sports editor and writer for Arab News. Um, And this is a perfect time to bring him on. By the way, he was the director of the documentary Anwar Roma, The Lights of Rome, which tells the story of the UAE's journey to the 1990 World Cup in Italy. So if you get a chance, you want to see that documentary. Um, but Ali Khaled is going to help us understand uh, how well did Arab do Arabs do at the Tokyo Olympics? Welcome to the program, Ali. Hi, Ray. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Ah, uh, but pleasure to have you. I, I know that uh, this was a big year for women and, uh, you know, kind of a tone, I think, that was set by Saudi Arabia, opening the doors uh, to women, you know, giving them much more. Uh, freedoms. And I think we out of 17 Arab countries at the uh, 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 Olympics that I read, uh, 14 of them were kind of they showcased the role of women. There was probably the largest group of women. How significant was that, do you think, in terms of how well we performed as Arabs? I think it's uh, obviously very, very significant. I think one of the things that helped uh, showcase uh, just how much, uh, you know, we've moved forward in this uh, in this side of things is that you know, the Olympic Committee for the first time allowed at the opening ceremony uh, two flag bearers to be like one male and one female. Right. So like in the past, there's always been like an issue, like who takes it. And, and this time they were able to nominate. And obviously, so as, as you mentioned, you know, like most of them uh, um, had a female flag bearer as well. So it gave them, you know, like visibility and like uh, to, for the rest of the world. Um, I think, as you mentioned again, uh, most uh, it's probably the most number of female uh, uh, athletes from Arab countries that we've had. Um, Saudi Arabia had two, you know, like uh, Saudi Arabia had like uh, the, the largest ever uh, uh, delegation of 33 athletes. 11 wow. individuals. Yeah, it was 11 individuals and 22 from the squad that played in the football tournament. So wow. obviously that, that skewed towards that. But uh, two of so them it's were, like 12, 12 different, uh, uh, 12 different competitions, 12 yeah. different uh, uh, yeah. sports competitions. Yeah, it's, wow. different, it's actually nine different sports for Saudi, which is a record. Um, the previous record was six in Athens in 2004. 
So, uh, so in every sense, I think Saudi Arabia like has had expanded uh, and like uh, backed a lot of its uh, athletes, and you, and you could see that also like across lots of other uh, Arab countries in a difficult, in a really really difficult time when it was not easy like to actually train and fund uh, programs. Uh, there was quite a few medals uh, in the end as well. And how did the Sa- let's talk about the Saudis first? Their team, how well did they do? How did everything go? Well, Ray, I think at the start there was a lot of excitement at the beginning of the tournament, obviously because. You know, everyone was like looking forward to to, to beginning their uh, you know their different sports and their different competitions. And all that. So the first few days, you know, there was a lot of like, excitement on that. Um, you know, it, it, to be expected, some of them, you know, just obviously didn't perform extremely well. You know, like you know they might have been eliminated early on and all that. But that's kind of to be expected as well. You know, uh, because they were up against like some you know, in certain uh, sports really formidable opponents who have been in the, in, in many Olympics before. Uh, so after that, you know, after a few were eliminated, I think there was a little bit of a, you know, maybe a bit, a bit of a lull in the middle of the tournament. But then at the end, there was a, like a flurry of activity and uh, for all Arab nations, you know, there was like quite a few medals. But in particular for Saudi, for one person in particular, Tariq Hamdi, who, uh, who won a silver in karate. And I mean, his story was very, very interesting in that you know, he was really not fancied at all um, uh, to go far. And he was beating like opponents who were like, like far, far more experienced than him at the Olympic Games. He got to the final uh, against an Iranian opponent. And unfortunately, while leading 4-1 with like very little time left, like the gold medal was within sight, uh, he got disqualified for dangerous play. Uh, uh, so unfortunately, he uh, had to settle for silver. But that was, uh, you know, obviously that was, I think that was the high point. That was the only medal Saudi got. There were a few others like really, really good, uh, like uh, Saudis who stood out. I think the rower, uh, um, Hussein Ali Reda deserves a mention because he he was really uh, competing with a with a punctured lung. You know he you know he he was told he shouldn't go to the Olympics, but he insisted. Ended up you know like his performances were a little bit up and down. You know, but like he really fought hard and ended up like racing five times. You know, so uh, you know like credit for him. Uh, the two female athletes, Yasmina Dabak uh, in uh, in the hundred meters, uh, you know, was eliminated. But I think she's like. Uh, you know, the first of many, I think, Saudis who will, will come forward. And I think she was one of the flag bearers, I think, wasn't she, for the team? She was alongside the rower, uh, uh, St. Aliweather. They were the two who carried the flag. Yeah, and I mean, it, you got to admit, it was very exciting to watch all this. I, I mean, it was phenomenal. Wasn't it very inspiring? And I, I know that uh, Arab audiences in Saudi Arabia and all over really got into it. Was there a big following? Uh, do you think the Arab world was more was watching this more than they have been in prior uh, Olympics? I think I think certain things happened that attracted a lot of people early on, which was really good. I think uh, I think one of the like, the landmark things for uh, you know events for for Arab athletes was uh, the Tunisian 18 year old swimmer Ahmed Hafnawi. You know he won early on. He won in the 400 meter freestyle. Uh, uh, he won a gold, and it was an absolutely incredible achievement because you know in the qualifiers he had qualified that he was like one of the slowest qualifiers, but then he went on. And like he, you know, I think he, you know, he shaved off three seconds from his own personal best, and and you know, the coverage that got like on social media and on the news really sort of like inspired a lot of people, like uh, you know, attracted a lot of people. And after that, you know, I mean, it, there was a really inter- uh, cool video that came out of his family watching him like race to the final, you know, you know, the final leg to win uh, the race, and uh, so that went viral, and a lot of people were interested in that. So. Uh, that kind of thing, and then obviously, like with like with the Saudis starting to compete, you know, with the Tunisians, with the Egyptians starting to compete, you know, more and more. I think people by the end were very, very interested in what was going on. All right, we, we're going to take our quick final last break, Ali, and when we come back, we're going to continue talking with Ali Mohammed Khalid about the Arabs in the competing in the Tokyo Olympics and what impact coronavirus had. I mean, with no audience. I I can't imagine. Now, I'm not a great I'm a political person. I'm not a sports person. For me, politics is sports. But uh, for Ali, who is a a superb uh, uh, editor, our uh, sports editor uh, for uh, Arab News with a lot of experience based in Dubai, sports is the prime uh, focus. Uh, But uh, for someone like me, I'm thinking, okay, in the few times that I played uh, in sports, I needed an audience out there. Otherwise, what was the point of competing? So we're going to talk about what impact it had not to have that big audience the way they've had at other Olympics. I'm Ray Hanania. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to continue talking with Ali Mohammed Khalid 
uh, the uh, sports editor and writer for Arab News about the Arabs and their performance at the Tokyo Olympics. We'll be right back right after these messages. ArabNews.com, bringing you breaking news from across the Middle East and the latest on Arabs in America. Get inside the latest headlines with expert analysis and insights at ArabNews.com. Join over 5 million Facebook fans and over 10 million monthly readers. ArabNews.com, news that matters to you. When you're looking for the best in optical care, Dr. Imad Nakash is your doctor to see. With years of experience and thousands of successful procedures performed, you can trust your eyes to Dr. Imad Nakash. See Dr. Imad Nakash and his professional staff for your eye care needs. There's two locations to serve you. In Hazel Park, call 248-336-3937. 248-336-3937. In Rochester Hills, call 248-299-3937. That's 248-299-3937. Are you going to start a restaurant or a grocery store soon? Do you need floor plans and designs? Call Naji Aboud at 734-744-9796. Do you want to buy kitchen and restaurant equipment at discount prices? Call Naji Aboud now, 734-744-9796. New concept products and design, the trademark of kitchen equipment. 5% discount on all purchases of $75,000 or more. New concept products and design. New location, 31185 Schoolcraft in Livonia. Learn more at www.newconceptproducts.com. Call Naji Aboud, 734-744-9796. Get ready for an amazing experience at Ishtar Restaurant on 15 Mile Road in Sterling Heights. Enjoy excellent hospitality from owners Ali al-Baghdadi and Fatty Bonham serving the best in Mediterranean food. Try Chef Ali al-Baghdadi's famous shawarma, the best Iraqi grills and food, and the best Arabic and international dishes. Dine in our authentic atmosphere or take out. Call 586-698-2585 or check us out on Facebook. Ishtar Restaurant practices all CDC guidelines and is open every day 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Have an amazing experience today at Ishtar Restaurant, 3625 15 Mile Road, Sterling Heights. The U.S. Arab Radio Network is proud to offer the Ray Hanania Show with veteran journalist Ray Hanania, the U.S. correspondent for the Arab News newspaper. U.S. Arab Radio broadcast content Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. on WNZK AM 690 in Detroit, WDMV 700 in Washington, D.C., and simulcast through stations around the country. Programs will rerun from 5 till 6 p.m. Visit us on Facebook at U.S. Arab Radio. And we're we're also streaming live on facebook.com forward slash Arab news. And welcome back to the radio show. I am Ray Hanania and we're on the line with Ali Mohammed Khalid, who is the Dubai based sports editor and writer for Arab news. We're looking at the Tokyo Olympics. Um, Ali, again, thank you for joining us. I mean, it's such a fascinating topic and being Arab all over the world. I think Arabs are so proud to see all these Arab countries, 18 of them participating in the Tokyo Olympics and sports. Um, just it, it just makes our image look so much better. Sports, so much better than politics, even though you're in the right field, Ali. I'm not. I'm in politics. Politics is just an ugly mess. Sports is beautiful. Tell us a little bit about uh, some of the countries that participated and how well they did in the Olympics. So I think in total, uh, uh, the number of medals that was won by Arab countries was 18. That's so phenomenal. That's uh, I'd love to hear that. That's great. It, it, it's really, really good. I mean, it's uh, it beats the previous best, which was eight, you know. So, uh, you know, they, uh, uh, it, I mean, that's it's the total for a whole tournament. In the past, it was eight. And so there was uh, 18. Wow. This so it's a, it's a big improvement. Of course, there's, there is still obviously room for improvement on that. But uh, it was, uh, it got five goals. Five silvers and eight uh, bronze medals. Um, it was good. I mean, it was, it's quite a nice spread, I think. You know, like, I think to get five goals was, was quite good. And don't forget, like, again, we mentioned the Saudi uh, karate by Tariq Hamdi. was, like, within seconds, really. You know, he, right. he 
had it. And uh, unfortunately, uh, because of the penalty, he, he got a silver. That was um, such an exciting, uh, you know, uh, competition there to watch. It was just really exciting. It was phenomenal. And, and, and that same day, which was the second to last day of the, of the whole competition, was quite a good one for, for our uh, uh, athletes. Um, Ferial Abdelaziz, who's also a karate, a female karate uh, um, uh, competitor for Egypt, she actually won gold, and and she was fantastic. She, uh, you know, like she had four matches in the morning in, in her in her pool. She beat everyone, and she I think she maybe lost one, and no, she won all their matches, I think. And uh, like she was she was confident right from the beginning. She was strong, you know. And uh, then she, uh, as soon as she qualified from her pool, she knew she had she guaranteed a bronze medal because whatever happened in the semi final, guaranteed a bronze. But then she just kept going. She won the semi final. She got to the final and she won that, you know. So that was another a great uh, performance. The previous day, another Egyptian uh, um, uh, athlete, uh, athlete, female athlete, uh, Gianna Lutfi. She also won uh, in the karate. Um, she won. Uh, she won a bronze as well. Unfortunately, lost her semi final, but that guaranteed her a bronze. So, and obviously, we mentioned uh, Ahmed uh, Hnawi, the Tunisian who won uh, at the beginning. Uh, there was a Kuwaiti shooter who won bronze as well. Uh, there was, you know, a few others. Obviously, like I'm, I won't go through all eighteen, but uh, it was very encouraging. As Arabs, it's great. I'm going to tell you, as Arabs, all the different countries is phenomenal. But as Arabs, all those and what was the record? This is a record number of uh, medals you said for Arab countries. The yes. Which is a total again, uh, 18. So, so we had 18 countries and we got 18 medals too. Yeah. I mean, I, I think they were concentrated, but like Egypt helped us a little bit, you know, they, yeah. Uh, probably, well, they've yeah. been in it since what? 1910. They've been doing this forever. Not all these Arab countries have been uh, going to the, you know, Olympics as long as some of the That's other true. countries. That so I can see us doing even better. What was it like uh, though? Do you think for athletes in terms of, uh, not having the audience. There was nobody really out there except maybe family and a few friends and their coaches. I think, um, I mean, it, it, the COVID, the COVID, the disruptions by COVID, it, it worked two ways, I think, you know. Uh, first of all, I think the, the major disruptions of like everyone uh, was expecting to compete last year, uh, you know, and, and to, to, you know, postpone it by a year, it, it does, like really, really damage uh, athletes' uh, programs. Although in some cases, some athletes who weren't going last year ended up getting the chance this year. So that was a positive for them. But it really did disrupt. Instead of the four-year cycle, which which athletes train to like almost religiously, you know, it ended up being a five-year cycle. So that 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 was one aspect. But I think that obviously the, what you mentioned was a big one, and not just for the athletes themselves playing in front, you know, without the inspiration of the crowd. I think for the watching audiences as well. I mean, some of the greatest Olympic moments are you know are you know because of what the fans you know that's the atmosphere was like in the stadium you know marathon runners coming in and being cheered on and and so on so like not having the fans not having the noise and the inspiration that i think affected the athletes for sure i mean it's it's less uh, you know less encouragement and i think also it affected how we viewed it on on uh, on television you know uh, it was really interesting i think that a lot of the sort of the passion and the excitement was transferred to social media a lot of people were posting like their views, their congratulations, like world leaders, you know, like the, pre the Egyptian president, you know, like congratulated uh, on Twitter, he congratulated his athletes, you know, in Saudi people were, were congratulating Tarek Hamdi, you know. So there was a lot of excitement on social media, you know, like, because and people were posting videos of them, themselves or their families celebrating because, you know, in the stadium, there was none of that, you know. Um, there is one, well, there is one moment I would like to mention. That sure. I think was, for me, it was the best moment of the, of the Olympics. I think and it deserves a big mention was in the, in the men's high jump uh, competition uh, there was a, the, the Qatari Motaz Barshim uh, was competing against the Italian Gianmarco Tamberi who was and they're like really good friends the two of them they both had lots of injuries and you know in the final uh, uh, leg of the competition they both cleared uh, two meter 37 centimeters and but neither of them could go higher so they were given the option of competing against each other to see who wins the gold. And, uh, and then the, the Qatari athlete, you know, said something which was, uh, you know, Matas uh, Barshin said something which was, you know, I think it's become like a bit of a, a famous saying. He just said, can we have two goals? And, uh, and the, in the competition, it's allowed if, if you want. So, so both of them ended up like receiving goals. And that was uh, one of the high points of the tournament. It really showed what the spirit of the Olympics was about. Yeah, I, so the, the big story, the big headline, I think, out of the Tokyo Olympics, uh, a large largest number of uh, Arab uh, athletes at, uh, in competition, 
18 Arab countries and winning the almost, uh, you know, d- more than doubling the number of medals that were brought back to the Arab world, 18. Yeah. Uh, that's phenomenal. Five gold, you said. Um, five gold, five silvers and eight bronze. Five gold, five silver and eight bronze. That's something to be very proud about. Uh, does anybody stand out? I mean, a lot of times the Olympics is a platform for somebody to their career to really shoot out there. Did anybody from our group uh, yeah. really kind of? I, I go for three above all else, you know, who really were inspirational. I've already mentioned them, but Ahmed Hafnawi, the, the Tunisian 18 year old swimmer. I think uh, he was quite inspiration an absolutely incredible performance to win gold, but also like inspired and like uh, raised the spirits of, uh, in his own words, he raised the spirits of a country that was going through a tough time, you know, so uh, politically going through a tough time. So, he, you know, he inspired them. So he was, uh, I think uh, the, I mentioned Perial uh, Abdelaziz, the Egyptian uh, karate player who also won gold. I mean, she's, I, you know, I, I expect like, her legacy to be quite big in Egypt. I think a lot of people will follow her example. And I think in Saudi, you know, like uh, the final one is uh, Tariq Hamdi, you know, uh, you know, Saudi's only medal at the Olympics, I think was, he, he put on an unbelievable show, you know, and it was, it was a shame that he lost in the circumstances that he lost, you know, through a penalty. But I think it will inspire, again, it'll inspire like a whole new generation of kids to look at him and think, you know what, it's not just, a, you know, I mean, competing is incredible. And, you know, the Olympics a lot of the time is about competing, but it's also about like, you know, if you win, you know, just the, the knock-on effect, the positivity that it sends back to the sporting, uh, um, you know, uh, industry in your country uh, is huge. And I know we got many more Olympics to come, and it's going to be great to see a lot of them and probably more new faces. Um, I'm hoping we have even more Arabs, Arab athletes competing uh, from more countries, because I think it does a lot of good uh, to encourage people to do good stuff. Any final thoughts at all, Ali, at all, before we say thank I mean, you? No, yeah, no, just a quick final thought. I think uh, yeah, I'm. I go along with you. I think we look forward to, you know, sometimes people get a bit cynical about the Olympics, you know, about the spending and, you know, legacies and all that. But then when you see the joy that these athletes get when they actually win, it's all worthwhile. And I will say one thing, it's, you know, competing, it's, it is about competing, but more and more, you know, we'd like to see Arabs also win, you know, not just compete. We'd like them to, to like be better and, and win uh, medals. I'm going to be telling everybody we had 18 countries. We had the largest contingent and we won 18 medals. That makes me feel good. And I bet every year, um, whether they're in the West, they're in the Middle East uh, or here in the United States, uh, we should all be proud. Ali, thank you so much for joining us. I, I, I'd love to talk about this more, but we only have one hour of radio. <laughs> so but it but uh, it was a real pleasure to have you on the radio this morning. Take care. All right. Ali Mohammed Khalid is the uh, Dubai based sports editor and writer for Arab News. Ali, thank you so much for joining us. It was a uh, it leaves me with a smile on my face. Politics doesn't always do that, but sports does. Thank you so much, Ali. All right. Um, uh, this is the end of the show. I just want to thank everybody. Uh, listen, you can uh, watch this program later uh, by going to facebook.com slash Arab News. Um, we also have a podcast. If you go to the Arab News website at arabnews.com, on the right side, you'll see the link to the podcast. We'll have that podcast up there. Um, so that you can listen to this show and all our past shows. Uh, we really appreciate all your support listening to us and uh, emailing us and uh, sending us ideas and feedback. We welcome all that. So thank you so much, everybody, for being out there and supporting uh, our radio show. Um, we're broadcast, as you know, live on WNZK AM 690 in Detroit and WDMV AM 700 in Washington, D.C. We want to also thank uh, former Ambassador Gerald Fierstein. He was a former ambassador to Yemen, uh, who in the first segment helped us understand all the dynamics of what's happening in that conflict there. I'm Ray Hanania. We will see you again next Wednesday, 8 a.m. Eastern Time, 3 p.m. in Dubai, 4 p.m. in Riyadh. Um, we will talk to you again. You guys, or, excuse me, I think that's 3 p.m in Riyadh and 4 p.m. in Dubai. Listen, you have a great time. We'll have a talk to you next week on Wednesday. Bye-bye, everybody. WNZK has available a...